Hello, everybody, and welcome. It is NBL Rewind, hashtag NBL Rewind. And, well, this is this is going to be a great deal of fun. Liam Santa Maria, hello to you. Hello. Yeah, I'm excited for this one. A little bit of Townsville Suns action. No doubt. And a man joined by who he was just a certified bucket getter. A little bit of interesting hair. We'll get into that. And a tiny bit of controversy as well. But when it comes to putting points on the board, our man could do it. Simon Curl, hello to you. Mate, it's good to be here from sunny Queensland. Thanks for having me. Hey, before we get into it, how, like obviously different people are going around different parts of Australia and dealing with 2020 in their own way. Personally, work-wise, how's it all been for you? Mate, well, I think we've been quite fortunate up here. We discussed beforehand. Um, I think with the, the weather up here has been amazing. You know, the spacing, we're not, you know, Melbourne and Sydney, everybody's on top of one another. Brisbane's quite spaced out. And, you know, it wasn't as, as hectic. I mean, we got shut down for 10 weeks. So, you know, our yoga studio... It, it definitely affected it. You know, they had a, um, the Courier Mail, the local, or the local paper, the, one of the major papers up here. Um, they, they put out a thing about a month beforehand and they did a survey on what was the best yoga studio in Brisbane and, and we won that. So it was, you know, it was creating really good momentum and things were going well and then, you know, Corona hit. But I think for us, we have an amazing student base here that were ridiculously supportive and to the point where they would stay on their membership during that 10 weeks just to support us. And the only time they'd go off it is if they lost their job. So, you know, f- for those guys, they, keep, uh, they kept us, you know, doing quite well, which was good. Um, and like, I, I mean, it's been hard up here, but compared to other parts of the country, I think we've been quite fortunate. Hey, just, just, on, just on the yoga studio, which you've now made, obviously, a very successful business, uh, you see a lot of athletes in all sports, NBLs included in that, who do yoga now. But it wasn't traditionally a way of which athletes did a great deal of it when, when you were playing. Was that something you got into while you were playing? Was it something post-career? How did that all work out for you? Well, mate, as you can see, when I played, I played with a little bit too much anger and uh, got a little bit too hot-headed. So, no, yoga hadn't found me that period of my life. <laughs> And, but I, I wish more than anything, I found it, you know, I only found yoga seven years ago um, and it was weird. I was involved with a lot of business um, ventures with an ex-friend of mine and they went really poorly. And I remember I was doing this little interview in a, in a magazine and the girl said, what's next for you? And I said, I don't know. I don't know why, but I'm, I feel like yoga is the next. Try yoga. I've never tried yoga. She goes, do it. You'll love it. I did it. Went there, loved it. And within a year, um, did my teacher training and then started teaching really within four months of my teacher training, which you're not supposed to do. But I just started running my own, my own classes just to get more experience. And then it just blew up. And then from there, I opened up a studio like 10 months after I did my teacher training and just kind of went from strength to strength. But one of the main things I wish I had a had was from the physical side, it would have been incredible for basketball, but, you know, meditation and breath work. And, you know, I wake it, I naturally wake up at 3.30 every day. I do about 45 minutes meditation and breath work and it just changes it would have changed my career i think if i had had that easily and people ask me and they think oh that's a little bit too much high the percentage i, I think i could have been a 20 percent better player i could have definitely channeled that that anger and that energy that i played in the passion that i had i could have channeled it in such a more productive way um where you know and the things that i know now you know there's there's breathing techniques i i I hooked up with a guy from Ireland. His name's Patrick McEwen. and he, he wrote this book called The Oxygen Advantage. It was the most amazing book, blew me away. Definitely, I check it out. And it, it just changed the way, only two years ago, but it changed the way I taught yoga and the way I breathe on a daily basis. And it is, you know, he works with athletes all around the world now. And it's one of those things where just by breathing the right way, you have more energy, you get less lactic acid buildup, you recover quicker, you know, you have more clarity, you have more understanding. It's just... To have those tools as an athlete, as a human, 
they're, they're like priceless. But as an athlete, now I'm talking, if you can get a three to 5% benefit on your opponent, that's a plus. But these things are going to give you way more. Like they, they're going to just physically give you at least 10, 15% more than your opponent will have if they're not doing them. So to have those things and an understanding of what to do, when to do it, and just, I mean, meditation is just, you know, it's, I worked with the Broncos, the Lions, the Firebirds, a little bit with the Bullets, not too much, and some other athletes. And all of them were great. And I remember there was one of the guys in the Broncos and he was just so anti. And I remember saying to him, because he was just negative all the time. And I remember saying to him, mate, you know LeBron James, right? He goes, yep. I said, he earns about $100 million a year across the board, maybe a little bit more. He's the greatest athlete in the last 25 years since Jordan. He's a freak. He's six foot 10. He's this, is that. I go, he has his own personal yoga teacher. So I'm figuring if he thinks it's a good idea, maybe you should look at it. You don't have to like it, but maybe you should look at it that it does do a benefit because that's the greatest player on the planet right now in any sport. So I just think if I had had that, it would have, it would have helped me. I would have been, you know, would have helped the teams I was on, you know, so it would have just channeled things a lot better for well, me. Considering 2020 and how it's gone, maybe the Broncos need a couple of double or even triple sessions actually, Simon. <laughs> Liam, you're, you're a yoga guy, right? Uh, sometimes, yep. sometimes in the lounge room, but I am fascinated though, because I've heard, I've heard you talk about this a bit, Simon, over, over the years um, and about how you wish you had of, you wish you had a found yoga and been, and been able to channel those emotions a little better as a player um, yep. during your career. How do you think it would have changed you? I mean, have you visualized how your career would have been different, how you would have been different as a player if you had been able to play with less anger and those negative emotions during your career? Yeah, I think... Like those, those, those emotions, they, they're beneficial, right? Because they make you who you are and they make you, but I, I still think you can play with that intensity, with that passion, that aggression, but it's when it, when it's channeled in a different way, like when, you know, referees used to annoy me. Now it didn't used to annoy me that they used to make bad calls all the time because that's what they're going to do, right? They're just, they don't have the, the ability to make perfect calls. That's not a problem. The problem that I had, and probably most players had, was their reaction to the player. If a referee does a bad call, they've got to understand that you're playing at the highest level. So you're competitive. So every now and then you're going to snap at the referee. You're going to say something that's probably inappropriate. And what happens is the majority of referees, not all of them, the majority, it's not just a couple, it's the majority, they have a little an attitude they don't like to be spoken to like that so they're like some policemen they have an attitude of authority they know that they can control what they can do so rather than just say hey simon listen if you speak to me like that one more time i have to tech you because that's inappropriate no worries because then if i do it again i'm an idiot mm -hmm. because he's been cool enough to tell me but very rarely will you get that you'll get them they'll look at you a certain way they'll say go on you know i've had, I had a referee look at me and say do it mm. and then give me a tech for not saying anything and the tech was for what i was thinking <laughs> that was roger shields right <laughs> and i said mate well what am i thinking now because you might have to call the police if you can read what i'm thinking mate. <laughs> so I, you understand that they make mistakes yep. that's not a problem but there's a way to handle it. you just can't aggravate because as a player, they, we don't want, you don't want to hear a referee being a smart ass to you. Come on, mate. It's like a, it's like a little nerdy kid in the, in the playground being a smart ass. You're just not going to, you don't want to tolerate it. That's just people's egos. That's how we work. Now, that's how I thought back then. Now, I still think those things, but I would react differently to that. So, just, you know. just, just, just on that as well. So while it wasn't mm -hmm. yoga or, or what you're talking about now, did you try and or try different ways or, or were you aware of trying to find a better way to deal with certain situations or you just roll through your career, just not even worrying about those type of things? You, you don't think it's a problem. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, one, one of Mark Bragg is, is just an amazing human being, you know, um, for me, he was great. And he was, he was doing everything to help me with that. But, you know, I was, I think I went to towns. I was, in, I was like 26, 27, you know, it's just like, man, you know, it was, I was silly. I was ignorant to the fact, you know, I read the books he would give me and, you know, I still stay in touch with Braggy to this day. He's just a special, 
human being. You know, he was one of a kind. Um, but no, nah, mate, I, I wasn't even going to look at things like that, you know. So just on that then, do you look back towards your, and we're going to get deep into your NBL career, and it, it's, uh-huh. it's a great NBL career as well. So it, it's one that you should be extremely proud of. But do you look back at it with any type of regret or frustration knowing what you've just told us? I look at the, the one thing I always wanted to portray at the end of my career to look back and say, could I have done anything more? Could I have trained harder? Could I have looked after my body better? Could I have given more to the team? And I couldn't. The only thing that I could have done is if I had those tools that I just went through, I wish I had it. It's not something I sit down and say, oh, God damn it, that would have been. It's just, it's happened, right? But, and I gave every team whatever they paid me they got back 100 times more than they paid me. There's not one team that didn't get that. Not just on the court. I did a lot of stuff off the court without being asked. I would do stuff off the court because I just felt to expand the game and to get into the communities and whether it was, didn't matter what it was, whether it was free clinics or whether you would do radio stuff or TV, whatever it was, it was like, listen, let's, you know, um, I just, the, the teams now, listen, we might not have seen eye to eye with a lot of things or certain things. And there's some coaches I, I you know, um, most, there's, a, there's only one coach that I, I feel um, I wish I'd never had to the experience with him because he was just, he was not, wasn't an NBL coach, you know. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, but unfortunately for me, I had one of my best years under Richard Orlick, you know, and it, may, it allowed me to go to Italy and play. But he, you know, having to spend three years of your career with somebody who didn't know what they were doing, I would rather have played 20 minutes a game on a team that was winning championships rather than playing 48 minutes a game, dropping 26 a game. But it did allow me to go to Italy, which is one of the best experiences of my life to play as an import over there. So it's kind of like these trade-offs, you know, what do you do? But in, in saying if I had to do it again and I had a chance in those three, four years to be a good role player that came in and did damage in finals and you won finals, I'd take that any day. Those are one of the things I wish that I had an opportunity to do. We're going to bounce around the timeline a little bit of your career, but before we get there, I can't believe we've taken this long to, to, to get to this. I can't believe Cam didn't open with it. Is, is that a virtual background you're rocking there or is that the best location we've had on MBL Rewind Mate, well, we're actually in my yoga studio. Do you want me? I'll give you a quick little let's have a look. Little look, right? Yes. So th- this here is this is Ganesh, right? So he's a mythical god. He's half man, half elephant. Can you see that, guys? Yeah, yes. oh, yeah. Got a great okay. look at it. So that there, he's about five meters high, six meters high, and seven meters wide. So I got a graffiti artist in here to do that. So that's in a, now he's he's known as the removal removal remover of obstacles in life. So this is the studio here. Just a little quick little run around. I've got three classes on today. And you'll see up there, I've, I've got into some gymnastic and body weight stuff for some extra training as well these days. I, I've gone away from weights and I prefer to, to do some uh, more fun stuff. That is so really good. cool. What a great, who's the artist? His name is Johnny, I can't remember his last name, Johnny Gimmick or something, but he's, he spent That's four good. days doing it. And I said, mate, I need it. I need it in four days. Can you do it? And mate, he probably slept three hours over the four days. So, um, but he did a great job. It was a phenomenal job. And, um, you know, we love that. So when people come in, and that's the thing, people, everyone that you know, and everyone is going through some pretty crazy stuff. So, you know, just to let them know that, hey, listen, you got Ganesh here. And even though you might be going through some shit right now, don't worry, stick with it, stay positive, keep, you know, he'll eventually get it out the way, you know, and there, there were times in my life I'd come in here after two or three years. I'm like, Hey, Ganesh, what's going on, mate? Give me a bit of help here. What, you know, <laughs> but he eventually got around to doing his thing. Nice. Nice. Just, just before I let you go, Liam, yeah. uh, best way for people to get involved. If someone wants to go check out your studio, play, uh, get involved in some classes, what's the best way? Yeah, mate, uh, just go to rawpoweryoga.com.au. You put that in and, you know, we've got online streaming. We've got about 700 um, on video on demand classes now through to, due to COVID. And we do teacher trainings too. That's probably one of my favorite passions. If we just finished our teacher training, we've got 20 new people ready to, to go off into the world. So yeah, just check out the website if you want and give me a call. Do the, bullets, do the bullets come in? They should be. Mate, mate I, I offered it to them 
four years ago. I you know I said I'd give them stuff. I'd do it all for free for them, you know, and huh. didn't really didn't really take it up. I was with the Broncos for two years and the Lions for three, and then Ben O left, and then things changed. So you know I haven't done the Bronx for a couple of years, and then um, Matty Haas, who was the strength and conditioning guy for the Lions, I think he's either gone to Port or Adelaide. I can't remember. So things just changed, but it's good to see the Lions are back. You know, so it's good to see those boys who were just kids when we started and now they're, they're kicking ass. It's great. Am I right in saying that um, when the Blitz was in Brisbane a few years back, Joey Wright brought his uh, his 36ers group through? Well, mate, he was supposed to. Oh, and um, oh no. what, what had happened is he said, mate, meet us there at 9.30. So I cancelled classes for them, oh, no. cancelled the schedule. And then um, no one showed up. Oh, and then, no. then he didn't answer his phone for three days and then um, then kind of swung it around on me. And, and, mate, I was just like, mate, just all you need to do is give me a phone call, mate, because okay. I cancelled classes for you. So that was supposed to happen, but it didn't. Oh, geez. But, you know, hey, good one, you know good one Liam. In. Good one, you Liam. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Responsibility, mate. Have some integrity when you're going to tell somebody you're going to do something. But you know who comes in is... Uh, Brock Motra when he comes from overseas okay. and um, uh, Teasy, Brendan Tease when he comes up, you know, mm-hmm. they'll pop in and which is always good seeing those boys. Nice. I, I, I do like the fact too, you, you've gone away from the weights as you just touched on as well. So have Liam and I, we haven't touched the weight in a long time as well. So we're not doing any sort of gymnastics or uh, uh, anything like that either, but we're definitely away from the weights. <laughs> Um, Simon, this we're, the, the game that we're rolling out, I don't know why Cam chose to roll out a game. <laughs> I like bright blue hair. I thought it looked brilliant. Late, late in the 97 season, you guys needed to win this game against Perth at home. Packed out furnace, as it always was. Yep. And, um, yep. uh, Rucker had 40. We should, be talk- should we be talking to Rucker? I mean, he <laughs> had 40. Was, was Ray O's on that team? I think so. i tell you who wasn't on the floor was Clarence Tyson. Yeah, Matt. Are you sure it was? Was that? Yeah, was it 97 or 98 season? I think it was 97. You chose it, Liam. I didn't choose it. You guys, because I think you'd lost, you'd lost a bunch in a row towards the end of the season. There it was. Okay, so I remember this. Yeah. So what had happened was we were rolling, cruising. right? And then we. Sorry, mate. My dog's not happy that he's not getting attention. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So we, we were rolling. All we needed to do was win one game out of the last five, mm. and Clarence blew his knee out. Mm. And I think we lost five by three points or less. And so if I remember, points. like. At the point when he blew his knee out, you guys, I mean, you guys might have been second or... We were, se- we were second. Right. We needed to win one game, man. One game. It was devastating. It so was you end up out of the finals. My question is, what do you think that Townsville Suns team could have done or would have done that year had that Clarence Tyson injury not happened? You know what? I don't know what we would have done, but I just know that of all teams I played on, that was, that was a team where everybody knew their role. Okay, so Jason Cameron didn't try to do too much. He was a great defender. He was a good rebounder. He hit the open shot, right? He didn't try to penetrate and do things he couldn't do. You had Tony D'Ambrosis. He came in and did his role. Grant Kruger would come in, set mean picks, rebound and play deep. And it was kind of like Derek, Clarence and I just had this, we just knew when it was our turn to, you know, we had a good little, it was a great free-flowing motion offense. And if you know how to play basketball, that's good because you, you can read situations. If you don't know how to play basketball, emotion offense sucks because you get in everyone's way, you stand still. And we just did a lot of moving. And I'm not saying, I love the Miami Heat. I love the way they play. They move the ball. That, like, it was like that. It was just things were moving all the time. And then, um, I don't know. I don't know whether we, you just don't know, but I know we would have scared some people. You know, it's... Um, when you when you had someone like Clarence who was Clarence was only six foot six, like and that's being very generous. Mm. But he used to get so low, he used to get his man so deep under the bucket. You know, I think he shot like 63, 64%. Mm. Mm. He was just it was in. And he boarded like a beast. Yeah. He was a great dude. I love well, him. He, he's a dude. He's a champion. He I think he was averaging about twenty two and fourteen or something. Yeah that season so a huge huge loss and it's a shame that you guys weren't in the finals because as i said the the atmosphere that you guys had there and the the chemistry you and rock had in the backcourt it it was a beautiful thing 
Well, mate, it's funny that you mentioned. I'd never really thought about like, but now I'm feeling quite depressed after uh, you bringing up how we could have done really well. Yeah. This is like, Talk to you, I med- if, I didn't, if I didn't meditate this morning, mate, I'd be all over this shop. <laughs> I'd be a mess. I'd be on the edge of a cliff. <laughs> let me, let me, let me pivot do a little. All your guests, do all your guests get this kind of treatment, mate? <laughs> <laughs> oh let me pivot you- a little. Focus on the positive. <laughs> yeah. uh, where, where did you have more fun? or the most fun, maybe order these for us, in Townsville alongside Ruck, in Italy as an import, or with long baggy shorts and red Converse with Parky in, uh, in the, with the Saints? Well, first of all, listen, Townsville for me was the best place in Australia to play just for the fans' support off the charts. I think mean, while I was there, every game was sold out mm-hmm. um, to the point where, you know, they gave the players two tickets and you had to pay for tickets, which is ridiculous to this day now just thinking about it. after you're bringing back these horrible memories <laughs> it's just annoys me that i had to pay for tickets to have people come to the game um townsville would be third listen my time with parky that year was like we were kids like i was just 20 21 and i'd gotten back from college and when i'd gotten back from college like in, in australia everyone's wearing these short shorts i'm like darty and we went to the owner we said mate listen baggy shorts everyone's doing it in america this is going to be the thing Let's go really baggy. And I said to Parky, it's, it's probably the first and last. Oh, yeah. I said, let's, let's wear red shoes. Let's just, you know, this, just get in everyone's face. And um, that was fun. But you know what? That was unreal. My time with, with Park was, but the experience in Italy is something. I never keep a journal. I kept a journal so I wouldn't forget stuff that happened. And when you go to a different country, they don't know who you are. So there's no judgments. There's no, okay, he used to do this. You know, they, they actually look at you and think, all right, this is what he can do. They don't worry about anything else. And you're an import. So you don't know, you could be handed a Qantas ticket to go back or Air Italia ticket the next day. Like, here you go, we don't like you. And I, I thought I played really well there. You know, I averaged, I think about 19, nine during the regular season and unfortunately got critically ill where I lost seven kilos in a day, the day before the first playoff game. Um, through an infection in my small intestine and the owner, they're not the owner, the general manager and the team doctor came to my house. They'd been calling me all morning. I was in the bathroom, passed out on the floor with vomit and diarrhea everywhere. And that was my first playoff game. So, you know, it was, it was weird because the, I was seeing Penny Taylor back then and she'd called me and I was like, I think I'm going to have 40. Like, I just feel great. I've had some high 20s. I'm just... Everything's clicking. It's just unreal. And then four hours later. Um, but the crazy thing with that was they took me to the game and the doctor put a drip in my arm. And I just sat in the change room like, while they put socks and shoes on my feet. And they left me there until 30 seconds to the jump ball. And they took me out onto the bench. And the coach goes, Simon, you okay? And I go, no. <laughs> And he goes, you uh, use your stats and uh, you do okay. I said, oh, man, cool. <laughs> so the drip is in my arm. I haven't warmed up. I haven't stressed. They take me out to the court. They, they throw the ball up and it gets tipped to me. So I take three steps and land on my face. Like I have no balance. I just fall flat on my face. That's not even the worst part. The worst part is they put me on the drip for the whole game. So I don't play. We're down by two with three seconds left in the game. He pulls me in and runs the play for me to take the last shot. (laughs) Now, I'm not even thinking it's going in because I can't feel my arms. I'm seeing 17 of the baskets. I don't know what baskets were. I'm just hoping that the ball hits the ring in a decent manner. It does not hit the ring in a decent manner. The fact that I even got open was a miracle. It hit the side of the backboard. (laughs) Oh my God. I'm like, mate, what, what are you doing, mate? What are you doing? You got nine other dudes who are going to take that shot. Did, so, you, did you get poison? I mean, this, did you watch The Last Dance with Jordan in Salt Lake City? Like, did you bring some takeaway to the... All I can... T- no, what I did do, it was in our hometown, but I did eat Chinese the night before with Scooter Barry. So Scooter Barry was my teammate. So, you know, um, yeah. Rick Barry's son and um, he's got brothers. I can't remember his brother's name. Um, Brent Barry and the other one. But he was my... And Scooter was great because he has a photographic memory for sight and sound. So he picked up fluent Italian within a week. 
So he and his his wife I'd hang out with, and we went to a, a Chinese restaurant. Now it's very weird when you see Chinese people speaking Italian to you, giving you Chinese food. I found that really just like seeing, like I'm in Bizarro world right here. Oh no! Now I don't know if it was the Chinese food that I ate in Messina, Sicily, but it was. I did get quite ill, and I was a mess for the next you know next week. I was done. But Italy for me was the greatest experience basketball wise. Because what it did is it showed me that I could play with those guys. Mm-hmm. And Chris Gent, I don't know if you remember Chris Gent, he used to play mm-hmm. for the Giants and then he was doing stuff in the NBA. And, and another dude, Chris Clack, who was amazing. They were on one of the teams we played against that were number two. And I remember that game where I kept, I kept Chris was averaging 20 plus and I kept him to about 12 and I had 26 or 24 or whatever it was. And, you know, I caught up with him afterwards and had a good chat and we hung out. But just to be able to, to see that you could do that, was it made me feel pretty good. You, you spoke before about one of the elements of that was you had no reputation over there. Mm-hmm. They, you know, the team that brought you in knew what buckets you could get because you just come off an yep. incredible season in the NBL. Did, were you different in terms of your personality over there where you didn't have that reputation, you didn't, you weren't the character that everybody here knew you and expected you to be on a nightly basis. I think I still, I still got into people's faces. Like you're dealing with a lot of different nationalities, right? So, you know, I, I remember there was a Russian dude for a team. Yeah, he used to fluff all the time. So, you know, you'd, you'd, you wouldn't be so outspoken, but you pretend to help him up, but you'd have words to him in his, in his ear. So he's still, you still get in their face and you still, be quiet but I guess when you're when you're over there it was just um I don't know it was just it was just a it was different I did feel like a different person where you know I wasn't as full-on I don't think um but then again you know when you're dealing with referees they don't understand English you know so and I don't understand Italian it's just like (laughs) so that was the the one thing I loved about the coach he he said he he didn't speak much English hardly any which was great because you didn't have to listen to him and he would say, um, I remember one time he'd go, okay, uh, Simon, shoot the ball all the time, all the time. Get him the ball. And he goes, you understand? I said, I understand. Do you I guys understand? <laughs> yeah. Do you guys understand? <laughs> he goes, you must shoot more. I'm like, mate, I got it, mate. No worries. <laughs> it was, it was, that was a nice feeling. It was like, mate, just give me that rock. But, you know, it was having Scooter as a point guard was good because you had... It's pretty selfish over there. You know, everyone's trying to do well to get a better contract the next year from Italian kids. Like they don't, the, the team concept really, I found was a hard thing to comprehend the selfishness of some of the guys. Um, the other import we had, he was, he was good, but he was really selfish. Um, and then there was another American who had a, an Italian passport who was, just didn't care. You know, just all, all he worried about was the other American and himself. And it just created a, you know, it wasn't, I think when you go to another culture, you should embrace that culture. So for me, I hung out with all my Italian teammates and I got them to teach me Italian words. And I would teach them and said, uh, you know, excuse the, the Italian, I have many Italian friends. I said, uh, in, uh, I will speak how Italians speak in a place called Carlton in uh, Melbourne. <laughs> And I remember Biagio, our team manager, Malcolm was doing something. Are we allowed to swear on the show? Yeah, sure. we'll worry about it later. We're not live. <laughs> um, he, <laughs> I, he was, Malcolm was talking and I said, tell Malcolm next time, that's a bullshit, mate. And so he just kept going around. Oh, that's a bullshit, mate. That's how he, so I had a hardcore Sicilian throwing him in some, you know, log on street, Italian slang. All, and mate, it was, it was, but they were good kids, you know, and the American, Americans didn't hang out with them. You know, they didn't want to hang out with them. And I just kind of did going to restaurants and doing, it was the best. It was just, it was one of the best times of my life. It did did but, your approach to the game change at all going from being in the NBL where you, you can't get sacked to being an import where you touched on earlier, you can get sent home the next day. Did it all change the way you went about the game or your perception of the game and training or, or anything to be all about what you were there as an import compared to a local? I, I did. I took exactly what I did in Australia yep. to there. And I mean, 
the last three years of my four years of my career, I'd never been injured. I had three ankle surgeries, and then even the final year, I was playing in excruciating pain. I didn't tell anyone, but it was. It was and you know what? The one thing for me is I overtrain, but that's for me. I'll live with that. That's that's okay. That's what I needed to do. Um, when I went to Italy, it was the same thing. I'd get there if we trained it. I think they trained at ten thirty back in those days, which is mental. You know, I would get there at eight thirty, and I would work with one of the coaches and do individual work for an hour and a half, and then. You know, I just, after practice, I just kept doing and they weren't really into weights, but I, I found a gym and I, I started going and then the team started doing stuff, doing stuff in a gym. And then, um, you know, so bring that mentality to that team, you know, like the other import would rock up. If we trained at 1030, he rocked up at 1029. So whereas I like to get there, do my thing, interact with the guys, you know, play around with them and then shoot with them. So it was, it was, I just took that same mentality because it was the formula was working here. I knew what I needed to do. And I think too, when you understand, I think I always, even though I was confident, I still always questioned my ability and belief because I always trained a lot. But once, once I got to a point where I knew that, okay, during the week I've done individuals an hour before every training, shot for 45 minutes after training, done weights and then done team training. I've looked after my body. I've done this, done that. I can't do anything more for the Saturday night game, whatever night game it was. Mm. And whatever happens is going to happen because I'm prepared. I can't do any more. Once mm. you understand that, the strength in just playing and not worrying about, am I going to have a good game? Am I going to make this shot? Because in warm-ups, I'd be like, God, I, you got to get, I felt, felt like I used to have to get in a rhythm and make every shot. And then if I didn't, then I would have a good game. There was all this mind stuff, which meditation would have been great for. But there was just a point where everything clicked. I was like, no, nah, man. You can't do anymore. You're ready to go. So there's going to be some games where you go off. There's going to be some games where you just miss, but you can always play hard and you can always give hundred percent across the board. I think a lot of people don't, you know, you can go one for 20 and they think you had a bad game. You can still go one for 20 and have a great game. There's just other aspects, but people don't look at that. And once I had that belief going there with that, I, I felt pretty good. Like the first game, it, it took me two weeks to get my legs after the jet lag. But then in the warm-ups, even Scooter said, he goes, oh, in the second game in the warm-up, just things clicked. And I had my bounce back, everything. And that's the game against Chris Gent and those boys. And I felt great. And then from that day on, it just got better and I got more confident. It was just, it was an awesome experience. You're saying, uh, you know, you're always going to have games where you go off. You had a few of those in the NBL. We're talking about this 97 season. You had one just a few games into your time in Townsville, 49, I think, in Sydney. Yeah. What? Tell us about a few of those nights where you just had it going in the NBL. It's funny that 40, like I've, got a re, I've got a good memory knowing where I played at in the NBL. Once I'm out of the NBL, I can't tell you what happened two days ago. But mm -hmm. I can track back. And in that game, I still remember that game. I was reading a Larry Bird book. We used to stay at the hotel right across the, from the entertainment center. I can't remember what it's called. And in warm-ups, I just, not warm-ups, in shoot-around, I felt great. And I had an interview with Steve Carfino. And then in that game, it was just, it just, it was just one of those games where you couldn't miss. I think I had eight threes in the game. My boy Parky and Tony Ronaldson, the Magic were playing. The next night, they were in the stands. So they were watching the game. And... You know, the, the one thing I'll never forget about that is I think that year I shot 90% from the free throw line and I missed the foul shot. Um, I was 48 and I had two foul shots with like 30 seconds left. Game was done. And I missed the first one. And the anger that went through my face, I was the thoughts were, I'm going to kick this ball into the crowd because what's the point? And I was like, nah, 49 is better than 48. So, you know, I hit the... But, you know, that came from, I'll never forget, like, I was playing with the Supercats the year before and we had just followed, or Richard had sold his license back and the last game was against the Kings and Alan Black said, uh, if I don't get Aaron Traher, I'd love you to come here. And I was like, mate, if you want Aaron Traher before me, I don't want to go there. And I was like, so then I think the next four games against Sydney, I might have averaged 35 or something mm -hmm. and spoke a fair bit of shit to the coaching staff. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been so insulted. Like, you, you outside of what Liam, 
<laughs> That's not what Liam did to me this morning. I've never been so insulted. <laughs> with, like, you know, um, <laughs> I actually felt insulted for you, Simon, now when I look back oh, on Liam's words. Please. please. <laughs> um, you're talking about your boy, Parky. You were talking about the red shoes, the baggy shorts before. Yeah. Parky, um, he t- you might want to corroborate this story, see if you remember this. Mm-hmm. Parky told me about how uh, late in that, 91 season with Southern Melbourne in um, mm. just before the merger. Yep. And you, it, was a, it was a game late in the season where you guys were playing Geelong. His old coach, Barry Barnes, who he wanted to make sure he gave buckets. Yep. Uh, do you remember that game? It might have been even the last game of the season. He had 50, right? Is that the game he had 50? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember Did he? Do you remember him coming into that game? Was it, were, were you guys locked in on him giving bu- Barry Barnes buckets? Mate, I would be lying if I said I can remember 1991. I just remember, well, we were, the team were like, when you had someone like Parker, who was a score, he was a beast as a scorer. Like mm. he was, and we had a, like, it was a, there was some good dudes on the team. Like Tad Dufamire was experienced and he was unreal. Just when someone's going off like that, you just give him the ball. You know, it's always good. And I think it's always good to see, it's always good to see, somebody who's been sitting on the bench not getting much time goes to another team Mm -hmm. and flourishes Mm. because how can you not have seen that you saw him every single day Mm. you know what i mean you saw that kid every day going to work but you didn't give him a chance like i I find that either some people are just oblivious to talent or they just have a personal thing where like yeah no we won't do it you know and i find that disappointing so did you feel that way about Gorgian? No, and you know what? That's the thing. I love Gorge. I, I played no minutes there. But in the NBL, it was probably the... I learned more from him in that one year than the entirety of my NBL career put together. He taught me more in less than 12 months than 17 years on top of that. Hmm. It was just... Wow. It's, the team was a pretty good team. Yes. Like we, you know, the team we had, there was like three or four Australian players or dudes who had played for Australia. Parky was on the team. Johnny Dorge just coming back. I think Perry had coming back from injury. You know, you're talking Darren Lucas, David Graham, Rob Rose, Bruce Bolden, um, Tony Rollinson. You know, and Bear was the man back then. Like it was incredible. Like our scrimmages were mm. off the charts. Mm. So it was to the point, the way Gorge, I don't know how he works it now, this is back in 93, was you, first two days, you know, first day's pretty light after the weekend, then you, you scrimmage, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, if the game's on Saturday. But mate, then we're the, we're the red team, right? They're the black team, the bench is the red team. Then the red team's, mate, playing D for the next three days. Now, if you're playing deep, now Parky's allergic to defense, right? There's, we used to call him there's we used to call him Andrew. There's no D in Andrew, right? <laughs> so when you've got dudes like us who are super competitive, we're trying to kill the starters now because we just want to win every game. We're not going to get to score. Mm-hmm. But then when we would scrimmage and we would beat them, we oh mate, we were you can imagine Parky and I just running around and <laughs> used to infuriate Gorge. He'd make us run sprints for just <laughs> acting like that. But it was good. The competition was amazing. Like, and the one thing Gord said, he goes, listen, I'll help you get another team. He goes, you're, you're too good to be sitting on the bench because you won't play for us. He goes, you should be playing. Hmm. And he was always honest. And I mean, when I moved to Townsville and Brisbane, I'd come to Melbourne, I'd stay with him and Amanda. If he wasn't there, I'd stay with Amanda in the house. Hmm. Like, you know, it was the, the, the relationship that I had with him was, was the best. Like, I love him. You know, there's not too many coaches that play three minutes a game that you love mm. afterwards. Mm. And I love that dude. And, and then that. you and then you really took off in Geelong, right? Especially yeah. your, your yep. second and third years there. It's no surprise that was off the back of that experience. Well, you, you just you learn when you're playing in a magic environment, like it's 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 so phenomenal. Like you just you got leaders like Rob Rose and Bruce Bolden, like they're your leaders. You you learn a lot from them and you know, in all fairness, I remember Jimmy Kelvin. A funny story about Jimmy. But um, when I'd gone there, I was kind of in a position where Tom Wisman had said I was, he was going to sign me in Newcastle and kind of screwed me, didn't sign Tony Jensen, which is okay. And then so Geelong was the only team left. And Jimmy Kelvin, I remember he sat me down and he goes, listen, we're going to give you a two-year deal, 20 grand the first year and 22 the second year, which is like poverty line for an athlete. 
And I said, no, no, I'll take the first year. Don't worry about the second year because I just knew I'd do well. Hmm. And he goes, no, you're not, you're not listening to me. You take both years or we don't sign you. Now, saying that to me makes me not like you. So I didn't like that. And I just played with a, like such ferocity that I wanted to do so well because I was going to make them pay when I got a, as a free agent. Hmm. And even though Jimmy was good for me to play for in that sense, I still had a lot of... Um, anger on somebody putting you into a corner like that. And I give Glenn Scott was our general manager. You know, I think that second year of the contract, I was averaging 21 at the time. He came to me and said, we're ripping this year's up. We're going to give you a three year deal. Mm. And this is what we want to give you. What is it? And I was like, mate, unreal. So that, that was awesome that the club management and the ownership, you know, did that. And they, they gave me that, um, that opportunity to get paid how you should have been paid. So that was good. Yeah. You mentioned earlier about when you're in Italy, you're still getting in people's faces. You're the competitive juices was still flowing. From an Australian point of view, who who was it? Well, could probably name ten players, but was there someone that you just got out of, you bounced out of bed, and you're like, I got them tonight. I'm looking forward to this matchup. <laughs> you know what? It, it didn't. I, I was just that confident in in the the year the year I went to Italy. It didn't matter. Like it just didn't matter. I, I just throw whoever you want because my body was in such pristine condition. I mean, I was always conditioned really well, but I was in such such a level that I just knew that you might be able to stop me for the first two or three quarters. I remember Warwick Giddy used to defend me pretty well at times, but I just knew that was wasn't fitter than me. And come that fourth quarter, I'd, I don't know how many times I had 18, 20, 22 in those quarters because um, I just felt unreal but I always wanted to do well against guys who I felt shouldn't have been in the Australian squad or team Mm because I never got a chance there was one chance I got one and they cancelled the the camp and I remember Gorge came to me after I got injured and said listen I want you in the camps you know but when you had guys like Phil Smythe running the Australian teams and he's putting in some of the players he put in those teams it was just disappointing it was disappointing not now I'm not saying I deserve to be on the team because the Australian team was so goddamn strong through the 90s and when I played. Yeah. But I definitely deserved an opportunity to go and train with the best players in Australia, be in that environment so I could have gotten better. And I didn't get that opportunity, not one time. How was it in a career of 17 years and some of the years that I had that I didn't get a chance to be in a squad of 30? Did, 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 you, did you get an explanation? Did, was there communication? Did you have the opportunity to ask anybody? Never, Does any come back know. your way because you're right? Well, it, and, you know, it comes down to my attitude, whatever it was. I didn't like it. But listen, mate, like if Cam Glidden can get an opportunity to go and play at the Worlds, which before, before Mitch Creek, which I think is so insane, like how, how do I not get an opportunity just to go and train with the best? I just want to train with the best. Mm. Like I said, you know, you had guys like, you know, Brett Maher and, you know, Shane Heal and Drewy. I mean, they're, they're your guards, right? They're phenomenal. You're not knocking those guys out. But you know what? I can go there and make it hard for them and I can learn from them. They can make me a better player. Mm. I would have been a better player, but I didn't get that opportunity. So that, that's, that's something that, you know, I think um, that's the one thing Gorge didn't care. He was like, listen, man, because he knows he's, he's, he's confident enough in what he does. He knows what you can do and he can harness the things that you can't do in a way that's positive. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's the intelligence of someone who knows what they're, they're doing, mm-hmm. you know? And you can see by those years, we didn't qualify New Zealand beaters to go to the world or whatever it was that year. Right. You, and you talk about um, like that emotion, the, the anger that you played with um, mm-hmm. and, and you're, you wish you had been able to channel it in a certain way. I feel like, like that, that reminds me of Jason Smith. Does Jason Smith had a, a streak inside of him when, and then when he snapped, like on the practice floor, it was like, it was on. Um, but I felt like through his long time with Gorge, he seemed to be um, able to do that, you know, like, and I picture that kind of, like I've heard you talk about the um, Ace of Spades. Yeah, yeah. That Ace of, you had the tattoo and that, that yeah. Ace of Spades mentality. Um, I, you feel like, I mean, did that help you? At the time, or no, 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 I don't think it hinders. It's just that was like I was reading Phil Jackson's book, you know, his first book. I can't remember what it was called, um, but that's I th- I'm pretty sure that's where it was from. That 
you know, when they'd go on, they'd throw the ace of spades on the wall and the ace of spades on the board stood for in the Vietnam War, when Americans conquered a city, they go get the highest ranking official, put a knife through his heart to say, hey, listen, don't mess with us. I mean, that's, that's like, we're professional athletes when I'm not going to war, but that was my, I was young. My mentality was like, it's either kill or be killed. Like I have to succeed to keep a job, right? And I want to give you everything that I've got, you know, and, you know, Jason was hard, but you know, the thing with Jason too, he was so athletic. Like he was just a, he was a beast. Mm -hmm. I, I could only wish to have one hundredth of his athletic ability because he was, you know, so you're playing against guys like that. You know, those, you can't tell me going to a camp and training against him, being worked by him is not going to make me a better player. They're, mm -hmm. they're just, they're just great players. Mm. And like I said, I don't think I deserve to be on a team, but I deserve to be on a squad of 30 um, to have a go and just become a better player. would have been nice. We're talking about uh, how well things were going in Geelong and you got that new deal. How much of a kick in the guts was it for you that when they fell out of the league? Uh, you know, it's funny. I, like I, the only, the thing that hurt me more than anything that I had a great relationship with the owner, Richard Austin, great relationship. Like he was like my second father and I still had the way my structure, my contract was structured was I had another year to go. I, sorry. I had one year to go, mm -hmm. but I would, I would get my money over the full 12 months. Do you know what I mean? So I wouldn't get it. Some players would just get over eight months or six months. And I was still owed a fair bit of money. The season finished mm -hmm. and I wasn't worrying about the next year. Not at all. I wasn't worried about the next year at all because I knew I'd find a team. Mm. But I was still owed like 60 grand from that year of money, you know, work I'd already done that they hadn't mm -hmm. paid because I had it stretched over till de to December. And he, he met with me with his lawyers and said, oh, we don't have to pay you. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, we've been told by our lawyers. I was like, man, I don't care what your lawyers say. You've got a moral obligation. This is money. You know, the NBL just gave you a million dollars. And the NBL had some money put aside, but I think Stax got all that. <laughs> I think he was the first one in and he got all the money, <laughs> him and someone else, <laughs> because there was no money left for anybody else. <laughs> but it wasn't much. Like, it was not much money. It's not Stax's fault. But the NBL should have made that owner say, hey, listen, cool, but these players have contracts that you need to honour and pay them out if they don't get jobs or, you know, or the people who have earned money and work for you that you owe, they owe. Um, and I just looked at him, I was devastated because imagine somebody you love and you trust mm. says that to you. Mm. And I was like, mate, and he knew, like I've got some friends who they're just awesome people, but they're pretty hardcore people. <laughs> and I, was, I was young, I said, listen, Richard, I, I don't really care for lawyers. But if I don't have my money by tomorrow, you know some of the people I know, I'll get my money some way or another. And there was a check waiting for me the next day, you know. So, but the fact that I had to say that, you know, I'm not saying it would have done anything, you know, but he knew the people that I knew. The fact that a 25-year-old kid had to say, listen, mate, this is money that it's, it's like I just painted your house and built your house for you, but you don't want to pay me. So it was um, that... After that, I was like, you know what? I had no feelings whatsoever for a club that helped me get back to right. where I was. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that was sad because I was really, I was gutted that he was like that. And he was quite a wealthy dude. So the 60 grand for him would have been nothing. You, you, you spoke about how you weren't worried about the next year. How many clubs came for you? Uh, I think it was like two or three. And... <laughs> At the time, I'd had an agent, but my, my old man was doing some stuff as well with another with a lawyer. And we, the deal was done with Towns. It was, it was a good deal. And yeah. I remember, you know, the guy who used to be in the croc as the mascot. I saw him out um, when I was with Geelong. He goes, why don't you come to Townsville? I said, mate, the only way I would ever come and play town, in Townsville is if I got paid a truckload of money. And then when I went up there, he came and made fun of me in front of everybody. He was like, I go, listen, mate, do you remember what I said? He goes, yeah, he said you would never come. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'd only come. I got paid a truckload of money. And he goes, oh, and I go, I got paid a truckload of money. So, but, you know, it was, um, like I said, it was, Braggy was great. I love Braggy. You know, I, I, I think if he had a, had a, an assistant coach like Stax before Stax became a head coach, would have made him even better. You know, because he... It's probably one of the things he lacked was some of the, the X's and O's that Stax knew and their personalities would have rubbed off and been great for one another.
So I think he had David Lindstrom, and if you know Dave, Dave's a different cat. <laughs> different cat. Um, before we finish up, which which magazine spread gave you more of a buzz, Blue <laughs> or Slam? <laughs> oh, you know what? First Aussie in Slam the, magazine. Yep. The, the the story of Blue was I was supposed to go in Black and White magazine. So, you know, it's their sister magazine. And then the black and white magazine, if you ever looked at black and white, it's, it's the Olympians used to go in there and do all their artistic photos. Same company. And we were all set for a date. And then they changed the date. They, they were going to push it back a month. But Stax had just come to the team. And there's no way I could say, hey, mate, listen, I've got to go to a photo shoot in Sydney for a day. I, I miss training. So I said, listen, I can't do that. So we have to put it off. Um, and they said, but listen, we've got a sister magazine that is just like this, but it's for the gay community. You get, they said exactly the same, same fonts, that same, the whole setup is exactly the same, same photographers. I was like, oh, that could be even more controversial. That would be even more, people will freak people out even more. And so I spoke to my girlfriend, she said, when is the next time you're gonna have the opportunity to have one of the best photographers in Australia do some artistic photos of you? And I was like, good point. So that was nine hours of, um, in a cold warehouse, very cold warehouse, oh, yeah. very, very cold <laughs> warehouse. <laughs> but the funny thing was, is um, the, the dude, you had two assistants, two, Stu, I still remember his name, Stu, and they were both gay, and Gabby was the photographer, and they put gold paint on me, so and all that was was some gold dust with some mango moisturizer from the body shop, so they mixed it in. Stu's doing the whole body, and then he gets to my private, I go, hey, Stu, I got it from here, mate. <laughs> he, I'll never forget him. He goes, Simon, that's the best part. <laughs> like, oh, I've got it, mate. It's all good. But you know what? I, I, mean, I, I totally forgot about Slam. You know yeah. I, mean? I know that the article in Blue, the Paul Freeman, who wrote it, he'd, he'd written um, Ian Robertson's book, who I'm good mates with. And, and Paul made me a lot better than what I am in that article. Like that's, that's good journalism. Cause I read that and I was like, that's a pretty cool, cool. It was a, I thought it was a great article. The photos were great. And you know, I'm probably sure if I read Slam now, I'd probably cringe at some of the things I said. And you know, I probably said some just dumb stuff. Um, you know, I said a lot of dumb things back in those days. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was all very entertaining. Part of it. You and got that's the thing though, the one, that's the thing It was, you know, I, you, you're always going to get in trouble for that. That was who I was at the time, right? That, that was my personality. But yeah. when, when you, like when I finished basketball, it was weird, right? I had, I got paid for a year and a half still. I still had a contract for a year and a half after I'd finished. So I had a bit of time to figure out what direction to go in. And, you know, I'd had some investments with some business partners who were ex-business partners and friends. But I still didn't have anything that, you know, that gave me the juice that basketball gave. And something just didn't feel right. There was something in me that didn't feel right. I didn't know what it was. I'd never seen a psychologist. I'd never seen anybody like that. And a friend of mine just said, you know, listen, you should go and see this lady. She's not a psychologist. She's not a doctor. But what she does is I can't explain it. But you should go and talk to her. And I, I work with this lady for twice a week, maybe two to four hours each session, just going through everything in life. And we did that for 10 months. And I didn't watch TV for 10 months. After that, I stopped going out. After that, I stopped um, having any kind of casual relationship with women. After that, it was just, it changed my whole entire life. And it, it just, it, it stripped, but imagine through life, through life, you, you, you get layers of shit that just through life, through experience, you break up with a girl, boom, that happens. Someone, your dad yells at you when you're a kid, boom, something. And so you build up these barriers that st stop you from being who you are because you, you put a thing around to protect. She ripped all of them down and just gave me a blank canvas. And the only way that I can describe it is like, all of a sudden, it went. my life went from being black and white because I was a black and white person. It's like, I loved you, I hated you. There's no in between. To all of a sudden, there's colors, right? And it was just, I had a lot more understanding of, where people are coming from. So even if if you do something, like normally if things have happened to me in the business world, I would hate that person forever. I don't hate them. I don't want to associate with them, but I don't have any angst towards it. It's just like, let it go, move forward. That's who they are. You can keep moving forward. Don't let that situation 
bring the rest of your life down. And she, she changed the way I think. And then I found yoga and that just helped out a little bit more. So for me, you know, having that experience of who I am now is completely different to how I was then. Yeah, there's, of course, there's some traits that they're not going to leave. Right? That's just your DNA. But who I was back then to who I am now are two. I like the person now. So, so I probably couldn't even read that, that slam article because I just know that I would have said some stupid things, some dumb things. Um, you know, through, and even throughout you know, my career, I've done dumb things and said stupid things. And whereas now there's a lot more thought to it and I like the person I am a lot more, you know, because I have a lot more empathy and understanding of what people go through and where they're at, not to judge them like I would have previously, you know. So it's, uh, it's good to get to a point where you feel that. And it's weird. I'd, I'd never talk basketball. So my students, most of my students don't know I play basketball. You know, if they, if they check the website out and they read the bio, they might, but none of them do. And it's to the point where about a year ago, I came in and two girls, they weren't arguing, but they were having a, a quite a discussion on um, one girl goes, Simon, um, Alison here is trying to tell me that you, when you played basketball, you were this type of person, you used to do this on the court, you used to beat people up, you used to talk and blah, blah, blah. And I'm arguing there's no way that you're being, there's no way that's, that's you. I'm like, well, I, yeah, I was. I, everything that she said, multiply by 100,000 because she won't know any of what really happened. And she was like, no way. I'm like, yeah, well, that's just, you know, but that's the thing in life, right? You, you have to want to be a better person on a daily basis. And it's not just being a better person, but you want to learn new things and you want to enhance your knowledge on, you know, whether it's breath work or whether it's business or whether it's education, just so your brain is always learning and you have an, an adaptation to where you're at. I mean, who wants to be the same person they were at 16? Mm. Like how many people do you know that you used to hang out with this that haven't changed? Like they're exactly the same. Cam. Now, I'm not, mm. <laughs> now I'm not saying that's a bad thing, right? But if you want your life to be exciting and you know, new adventures, then you've got to go outside of your bubble and do things that are different that you've never done and get you out of your comfort zone. The one thing we talk about in our teacher training is you need to get uncomfortable. You need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So do something. And then when you conquer that, then your self-esteem gets better. Your confidence grows. Your knowledge, you're like, oh, I can do that. I never thought I could do public speaking. Okay, boom. And it's just, we grow as people. And then you become a better person because you start to see things that, like the way I used to think, I was a moron. Like back then I was, I was a moron. You know, it's just, I would be, like even I've, I've got some, I don't know if you ever watched those Fox sports shows that I was, I was on, Fox sport had inside basketball. Mm -hmm. Like, mate, I, I watched one for 30 seconds about six months ago, I turned it off. I'm like, God damn it, I was an idiot. <laughs> it's entertaining for people, but I was an idiot. It's like these it idiots was. On, 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 it's on, it's like people on reality TV shows, these people on The Bachelor and Mar <laughs> what's it called, Married at First Sight. I mean, you're idiots, but you don't realize that you'll watch it in 10 years' time, you realize you're an idiot. You but know, so. you're right, though, very entertaining. Mm -hmm. And I remember, Drew, <laughs> at the time, you used to talk about sport needs heroes and villains. It yep. just needs that to be successful because it is an entertainment product and I'm happy to be that villain. Do you still believe that? Yeah, for sure. I think you need, you need, like you look at, imagine if everybody went, you know, everybody was super cool. Like Charles and those guys must look at the NBA now and be like, what is this, mate? Like they'd be too scared to knock the other person's head off. Do you know what I mean? There's, like there's no way that um, LeBron's going to try to take Jimmy Butler's head off on a, if he was, pissed off you know it's just like mm. i wouldn't have cared it's just like hey bang i remember i clotheslined jason smith because you know they were beating us in brisbane it was a semi-final of my last year i was just annoyed you know it's like i wasn't trying to hurt him but I, I wanted to hit him pretty hard where it was like you know i think it was jason smith or maybe it was cj i can't remember um but it's like you know most people would have just fouled him softly i was just like listen we're gonna lose here it's just like this is bullshit i'm pissed off it's like bang that's what you know i think it does keep it entertaining i mean that's what i don't know what the nbl is like now it's a little bit um 
when I was commentating, it, it, it didn't seem too too much of that. You know, it, was, it seemed a little bit. Everyone's pretty chill. There's not much much of that going on, and there was no real personalities. I'm not saying they weren't good players because they're great players. You know, some really good talent there. But at the same time, you're like, oh, it's, you know, what do we got? Bogues, and I didn't get a chance to see Bogues played when I was commentating. That mm-hmm. was, like, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't um, on the on the broadcast for those ones, but. He's probably the, the biggest villain you've got right now. And, you know, it's, um, I don't know how hardcore he goes anymore, but he seems to go pretty hardcore on Twitter, I, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> he loves his Twitter. See, I, I, all I know is if they had had social media when I was playing, oh boy, oh my God, that would have been the worst thing in the world. I'm so <laughs> glad. Just on the court, off the court, it would have just been a travesty. Oh, man. <laughs> it would have been. You know, we were being kicked off. I would have been kicked off Twitter for sure. We were being kicked <laughs> off with so many things. So I'm kind of lucky that I don't, you know, live in that that realm now as an athlete because you you mm. can't do anything now. Mm-hmm. Like you you better be. If you do anything silly, you're you're an idiot because it's like cameras are everywhere. Like mm. everyone's got a camera that's just straight to social media. Mm. So that'll be that's that was pretty a pretty good thing that we didn't have back in my day, hey, which was good. We- we do have Twitter, hashtag NBL Rewind to get involved. If uh, you've watched the game, you had a listen, you want to talk about Simon's career because it was incredibly entertaining for us yeah. and fun to watch for so many years. Liam, since you uh, chose the game and, and started the interview, mate, you want to end with it? You got anything for Well, Simon? I think we need to suggest, because you and mm-hmm. I don't choose the game. Yep. Let's get that straight. We need to suggest that that 49-point game yeah. from that season – Maybe Sunday showstoppers get or that. something. Get that, get that rolled out. Good idea. And you know, and, and you know what? That, that that was probably my highest scoring game. But I think in that that year, that year I had in Brisbane, two thousand and one. I think there was there mm. some games there that across the board, you know, penetration, pull ups, deep mm-hmm. play. There was just that one was just a big. Like, I'm, I'm totally you watch. I watched that game. Adam Howarth gave it to me on CD back in the days, and I got it converted over to a hard drive. And I watched that, and then I watched – that was in 97, and I watched the 201. So it's only four years. But I was literally twice the player. I was yeah. quicker. I was more explosive. Like, everything – my pull-up off the dribble it was a completely different player. It's amazing how much it changed in that three- to four-year period. Um, and I kind of look at it. It was, it was nice, though. I like uh, – what's his name? Warren. Who is the commentator? But I liked it. One thing I hit, I hit a three to put us up, and he goes, "Oh yeah!" And I was like, uh, "I know he got that from Stuart Scott, but he used it well in that." Um, okay. That yeah, it was a good, good little game. That was that was the season you were third in the league in scoring behind Hammer and and Drewy, twenty five yep. a game. So was that yep. under Richard Orlick? Unfortunately, yes. Huh. Yeah. Now, he, he was someone I would not let my 12-year-old daughter go and allow him to teach. Just his skill level was... He, I don't know how he got a job. I really do not know how he got a job in the NBL. It just, it's I, fascinating though to talk about how you played your best under a coach you well, hated and you well, hardly think, saw the floor under a coach you loved. Yeah, I know. And that's the thing. Right? It was good because, it, like I said, it was a catch-22. It allowed me... But, you know, listen, this is how... This is... My father had just been sacked, which mm-hmm. that's sport. So that didn't phase me. I felt bad for him, but it didn't affect me at all, right? That's the world we live in where we have to judge that. We have to accept that. And then I went to Richard. You have your talks with him. I said, mate, listen, I'm here to play for the club, play for you. Well, yeah, that's unreal. Love it. And I, mate, I still had two years to go on my contract. I left that meeting. He's, I get a phone call from Copes saying, mate, Richard Ollick just called me. He said he wants me to come and play for the board. I was like, huh? What? Just had this good meeting with him. So I don't have to go back in there and pretend that, you know. And I just said to him, I said, mate, this isn't the way you, you start. Because he lied. You know, he, just, he was trying to get rid of me. Without, so it's just like, and then I had to sit there and watch all these, you know, these under 10 drills, mate, for three years. It was like, I felt like I was back playing for the St. Kilda Saints down at Albert Park um, back in the 1980s, you know. So, but it did do that. It did allow me to go to Italy. Mm-hmm. But like I said, mate, when you're second last, last in the league and you're not playing in finals, you don't have a chance to win championships. I would take, now I don't want to say I want to play three minutes a game, but I'll take 20 minutes a game playing a, a good role off the bench. I would have done that for the next 10 years. It would have been great. 
Hashtag well, NBL Rewind to get involved, mate. It's been as entertaining today as it was watching you play for such a long period of time, man. We love what you're doing and how you're taking on life. And uh, no doubt, when we're allowed, because currently Liam and I have, of course, restricted in Melbourne at the moment, but when we are allowed, we'll get up to Brisbane, we'll take in a Bullets game and uh, we'll get on. Maybe not the rings that you showed us, but definitely in the yoga studio, mate. You can take us through a lesson. Mate, well, we'd love to have you at Raw Power Yoga. So uh, we, we've got we've got classes for all levels, mate, beginners to advanced, <laughs> and even from people before beginners. Yeah, that's what we need. You guys will be fine. You guys will be fine. <laughs> but mate, I like I like. Did you deliberately did you deliberately wear that Raw shirt, mate? Because we're Raw Power Yoga land. Raw Power. Nice. I'm trying to help <laughs> out. Yeah. And I I thought I'd go a little bit colourful because I knew that's how you were. So uh, I think we've well, you, that's sort of Liam playing a game that you lost. Come on, uh, man. I think it's all been great. Mate, you you know what was the, the colourful hair was there was there was a young there was a young girl in Townsville and she had cancer. So I did the blue hair before she'd gotten cancer, but then the following year her someone had reached out to me and said, Listen, you're her favorite player. Can you great kid? You know, she was fifteen. A legend at school, basketball, everything. And she went she wasn't feeling well. She went to the doctor one day, they said she got ninety percent of the body is riddled with cancer. She's got a month to live. So I went and visited her in a hospital. And it was one of those things I, I got to know her really well. And I said to her mum, I said, Chris, I feel really awkward being around your family, knowing that she's not going to live. She says, for the hour or two hours you come, she doesn't think about dying. We need you here. And so I'd sit and chat to her and I'd say, hey, what, what do you, you know, what do you want in the game? Do you want me to, she goes, oh, can you, can you do your colour? Do your hair this colour this time? And so that's when I went, there was a stretch there. I did like a few different colors in that, that season. I think I said, had pink with a Nike swoosh. And there's a whole bunch of different things. Um, and I used a couple lot of shit for it, but it was like, it was worth copping the shit because she was a good chick, you know. Did you, um, did you speak about that at the time? Did people know that at the time? No, nah, nah, it's just, you know, just keep it, no need. You know, what's the point? I mean, I'd done it. I'd had colored hair before that, but she liked it. And she said, oh, can you do, right. can you do uh, electric blue or pink or whatever it was? So, you know, you just... I still remember the, the day she passed was she looked unreal. You know, she's upbeat. I said, babe, you're going to kick this. She goes, I know, I feel great. And then you got a phone call five hours later that she was passed away. But she did want a ball, signed ball, Townsville Croc ball. We put in her, her, her burial, which was cool. You know, hmm. but those things, don't worry about that. Like I copped a fair bit of shit from Saks and doing stuff like that. But, you know. Did he know but what? Like a, nah, but it shouldn't matter. I'd known Stacks for ages, you know. And there, like there was, that was the thing. I learned, I love playing for stacks. Even that was really hard for me and him that year because we we went at it a fair bit. Um, but we made up after that, and I he I learned a lot from him too because he was kind of gorge, you know, he was under gorge for a long time. And mm -hmm. I think I'm just really surprised that, you know, that he's still, you know, he could definitely be a head coach. He's, he was great. I learned heaps from him. It was just it was a time where, like I said, if I had a, if I was who I was now then that situation could have been resolved a lot more. But I didn't have the tools or the capability to deal with that situation the way it should have been handled. Mm. So, um, but I'm glad that I've, I've, we've made up and we're, we're cool again. So that's good. I think we've well and truly wound him up though. You're going to need to turn around and get your meditation on, man, when we finish up. So we've, we've gone to some, we have. We've gone to some places here. We have, and it's been unreal. And this is exactly why uh, Liam and I love doing what we do. And you've been no exception, mate, to have a chat to you. And uh, we could have probably gone for another three or four hours, but mm. we know that everyone's got so much on. So we'll definitely have a chat to you again sometime real soon, mate. We'll be up there to jump in the studio as well when we're allowed, mate. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, boys. Take it easy. Hashtag NBL Rewind to get involved. Have you got an isolation conversation yet, Liam? Or you got to wait till Saturday morning? You need to wait till Saturday. I know, okay, you, I know you're anxious. Done. I know you love them. I do love it. That's what I want to know. NBL Overtime next week. We'll see you then.